I, I wrote Psychoanalysis and Feminism uh, to ask feminists to take on board psychological factors mm -hmm. that that uh, it, it's internalized in women as well as in men that, that women are an inferior uh, group and that w women must under use psychoanalysis. When I had written that, I well, what had happened was in order to, to write uh, in America at the point in New York, everybody, everybody was blaming uh, Freud for the condition of women. Um, there was a sort of calendar with um, a dart sport over it and a, a dart through Freud's eyes. And, and I didn't realize at the time that actually the American system of psychoanalysis was very different from the European one, but I didn't realize that. But they were completely just saying that psychoanalysis was was the bet noir, that Freud was the bet noir. So I I I then thought, well, wait a minute, I'll go and read some Freud. I don't, you know, not not really read Freud. So I went to the British Library when I got back to England, the British Museum as it was then, uh, to read five major articles on women by Freud, and ended up reading twenty three volumes, um, and wrote Psychoanalysis and Feminism. And at the end of that experience, I both were so taken with it, but I also thought, well, I want to know where these ideas come from. So I applied to train as a psychoanalyst. And so that's been more dominant than the structural theory of women's, uh, of, of women's longest revolution. So it's not that I've given up on that. It's not, it's that since then I have trained as a psychoanalyst and, and stayed in full time, uh, is a full time psychoanalyst, which again, nobody, me included, thought I would do, but I did. I kept an academic side of myself by lecturing in the States mainly because you go into any department and just talk your feminism out. Um, but uh, I then in, in the late 90s or 96, I decided you, from as a clinician, you work from the bottom upwards you're like a builder as opposed to an architect or something you work from the bottom upwards and i thought actually i need to get back into some some top downwards thinking about about theory and what's happening so um i applied for, for a job and that's why i'm landed up in cambridge university in fact that's uh, that was where where i'm talking to you from i still i founded a center for gender studies here in the in the university so it's I shift, but the big chunk of 25 years, I was a psychoanalyst, as well as doing some academic teaching and obviously lecturing, and as well as being a feminist. And the latest book, which we haven't got to yet, so I won't talk about it, but it's it's reverse, it really, it's both a carry on from psychoanalysis and feminism and a reversal of it, which when we get there, I'll explain. But so it's not that I don't agree with myself <laughs> that we the four structures matter, I do. Mm -hmm that my orientation has become very much I, I'm very much still a psychoanalyst I mean I still do clinical work as a psychoanalyst your anecdote of, of deciding to see what all the fuss is about about Freud and then ending up reading the 23 volumes and then writing a book that changes everything about how people think of the relationship between psychoanalysis and feminism that, that that's sort of uh uh, to me, a, a familiar kind of anecdote. Uh, I, I recently read Sheila Rowe Botham's um, memoirs of the of the period. What, what was it about that moment that produced such a lot of good intellectual work? And what was it about that moment where it seems like you and other colleagues were just able to um, see things afresh all of a sudden and, and ab absorb great masses of material and and uh just suddenly have a really original take on it i mean the the other thing i've thrown i think women the longest revolution can also be understood quite rewardingly as as the contemporary of the nairn anderson thesis in the new left review at the same at the same time i mean it it, it it's important to understand it alongside other feminist material but you know, non-feminist Marxist material of the moment as well has a similar kind of quality. What was it like? That's very interesting. Um, I think it, I was going to say something that would have surprised me. <laughs> um, and then you're bringing in Tom and Perry, who I've been thinking about a lot 
recently. Um, Perry read uh, this, I sent him the preface that I'd written for, for um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I sent it for to him and we disagreed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but now I would agree with him rather than with myself, because I said that I thought that in selecting sexuality as the weak link that was going to be the forge into further breakdowns of these the structures, I thought that that had so much been a male view rather than a female that rather than a female view at the time because but I was going to disagree with myself now and say well actually of course sexual liberation was very liberating for all of us and that did happen that's that it, it, sexual liberation was intellectually liberating yeah. for everybody hugely and that really only came in the early 60s and it came very much you know, you know, key. It was dangerous for for women to use the the certain pills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It wasn't very well monitored, sort of biologically, and all sorts of things. I mean, a friend of mine did die, did die, um, but nevertheless, it was a huge liberation. It was just transformative that sexual liberation. It just, you know, to think of the fifties and compare the fifties with the sixties is huge, huge. So, as I say, I think it, it, it was for, it was much, not as much, well, it was as liberating for women as it was for men, even though it was, as always, women were getting the worst deal, <laughs> so to speak. But even though we were getting the worst deal, it was, it was transformative. 